Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So the first speaker of the next session uh, will be Marcus Schaefer, and he's going to talk about theory of planarity. And uh, I'm really glad to have you guys here to talk about all that crazy graph drawing thing at Microsoft. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Since we were talking, or since we were supposed to be doing something about games and puzzles, I figured I'd start with a puzzle. You may know this one. Does it look familiar? So the point is you have three neighbors, A, B, and C, and they're trying to get out of the common grounds they live in, but they don't like each other. That's why it's called the quarrelsome neighbor problem. So the paths have to be disjoint. They cannot uh, cross each other. So the question is, is it possible? Can you get everybody out of their gate, A out of A, B out of B, and C out of C, without introducing any crossings? Or climbing over the wall, helicopters, other bad things? Okay, quick vote, who thinks it's possible? Okay, who thinks it's not possible? Okay, and that in audience of experts. So, why don't we know? If you were looking for this type of problem, where would you look? I mean, it's obviously a planarity problem, right? But it's not the type of planarity that we know from Korotovsky, right? The type of planarity that I've been studying for, <coughs> uh, for a while. Which is a little bit uh, ironical. This particular problem is from a collection of puzzles by, uh, by Lloyd. I have, um, there's actually interesting, the uh, video version of it made around 1916, 1917, where the neighbors quarrel because one of them supports the Kaiser and the other two uh, do not, uh, made by uh, Edison Company. You can find it on YouTube. Uh, I don't have time to show it. But, so the problem is old, older than uh, planarity as we know it. As a matter of fact, the problem is about 600 years old at least. You can find the first version of a book by Luca Pacioli, who gave us uh, double counting and things like, double bookkeeping and things like that. It's an old problem. What, uh, what do we know about solving this type of problem? So there's been some progress, but really, we've only started looking at this in the past 10 years, even though as a puzzle, it's older. By the way, here's the solution, so it can be done. For this particular type of problem, it can always be uh, done. Let me just show you one more that adds a slight level of complexity. This is another problem of Lloyd's. As far as I know, it was not published in any of his book collections. You have to go back to the uh, original uh, newspaper. The goal here is to get everybody outside at the gate that's just across from them without introducing any crossings. And the trees are placed there so that you can only make, in essence, orthogonal drawings. So you can only go straight or turn at the, the trees. If you didn't have that restriction, it would always be possible because uh, um, uh, yeah, why? OK, think about it. But uh, it would be. <laughs> but if you, have, if you have the grid restriction, suddenly the problem becomes harder. It may not always be possible. In this particular case, it is. I don't have a picture of the solution, Light hat one. It uses every single turn you see. So it's actually a pretty, pretty hard solution. Uh, I don't know whether newspaper readers today would be interested in solving that type of puzzle. But you can take this, and I think that's, uh, that's where there's still a lot of material out there that maybe we haven't, uh, haven't looked at carefully, and turn it into something commercial. So there's a game called Lap Mice. If you haven't seen it, it's, uh, it's a cool little gift to give away, which is essentially just that. You have mice of different colors, and you have to connect them to the trees of their <coughs> colors in a, grid, uh, in a grid drawing. That problem is pretty certainly NP-complete. I haven't worked out the details of the, the problem. But you can take these ideas, and you can turn them into commercial product. You can buy that at the, at the stores. OK, so much about uh, games. The Sears version of this is uh, called Partially Embedded Planarity. And really, as far as I know, this was the first paper we have a couple of the authors here, so they may speak to that, that defined this problem properly. And the paper is only about two or three years old. So what is the problem? You have a graph 
that's partially embedded. Uh, what that means is not entirely clear because that partial embedding may not be of a connected graph. And once you have this connected graph, like look at the black components there, what does it mean to be an embedding? Like can the pieces move relative to each other, like have different facial structure? So even finding a combinatorial definition of what it means there to be an embedding is not entirely obvious, but it can be done. And for this particular version, we're not allowing the different pieces to move. So you can just think of it embedded as subset of the plane. And then the question is, if I'm giving a graph, subgraph of it embedded like this, can I extend that to an embedding of the full graph? So that's exactly the problem that Lloyd was asking here. You can model it as such. And uh, they showed that this can be solved in linear time. <clears throat> uh, so what's my point here? Well, apart from planarity, which we've studied pretty well, there's all kinds of other planarities out there that have maybe gotten less attention, but they're all somehow related, like this partially embedded planarity, which really should have had uh, precedence because it's significantly older than the idea of uh, planarity. So here I've put together all of the ones that I'm aware of, you may know some others and be happy to hear about it, that I think are in some sense variants or very close to planarity. So up there, outer planarity, standard, the usual planarity, level planarity, where you're assigning coordinates to the x-coordinates to the vertices, radial level planarity, where you're placing the vertices on uh, concentric circles and you're ordering them just like level planarity famous cluster planarity that we've heard a couple of times about. I'll talk about simultaneous embeddability in a second. Partial embeddability, which we just saw, weaker notion would be partial rotation, meaning you specified each vertex, the order of the edges, or just the order of a subset of the edges at a vertex. Maybe you allow those rotations to flip. Two-page embeddings, there's a couple of different variants, and there was a talk, which I missed unfortunately yesterday, uh, on that which is a special case of book embedding. With books, we're leaving planarity, right? As soon as you have three pages in a book, that's no longer really planar. So two-page embedding are really the only planar ones. Um, upward planarity, directed edges all have to point the same way. And then simultaneous embeddability for multiple graphs and weak realizability. Let me just uh, define. Uh, two of those a little bit more carefully. C planarity, I think I can skip because we've seen the definition a couple of times. I hope the picture reminds you. We cluster the vertices and we have certain restrictions about how the edges can be uh, drawn in those um, clusters. The tricky case here is if the vertices in a particular cluster are not connected. If you always know that they're connected, then actually there's a linear time algorithm for deciding it. Uh, the simultaneous embeddability problem is you have multiple graphs on, um, on vertex sets that share edges. So here we have uh, six vertices and three different types of graphs, the solid edges, the, um, the dashed edges, and the, the uh, dotted edges. If you put all of them together, you can show that there is no uh, simultaneous embedding of these three graphs. This is called with fixed edges, meaning that edges that belong to multiple graphs have to be drawn the same way. So for example, you see the double edge here, which is um, dashed and solid. You can't draw these two different ways. They have to be drawn the same way. So two graphs sharing an edge must, must be embedded in the same way for that particular edge. So for this particular graph, you cannot, um, <coughs> uh, you cannot draw it. This would be an SEFE. Uh, Actually, it's an SEFE2 problem. I don't actually have dotted edges. If you had three graphs, it would be SEFE3. Can I assume you've all seen simultaneous planarity or the definition as I just gave it made sense? OK, then let me go back to the picture I just showed you. Uh, this, um, what I tried to do here is pull all of these notions of planarity together and see how they relate in terms of computational complexity. So what you see here is all that I'm aware of. The upper part here, 
up to that line is in polynomial time. All of these things can be decided in polynomial time, many of them in linear time. Everything down here, below upward in book, is NP-complete. And there's this really annoying little part in the middle, clustered planarity, famously, simultaneous embeddability with two graphs, and uh, partition T coherent two page drawings, which we don't know. Do they go down or up, polynomial time, or NP-complete? Uh, the other thing you see is the edges between them. These are reductions. So as some of these are new, this tells you something about the relative complexity of these problems. For example, level planarity, you can look at as a special case of radial level planarity. So if you can solve radial level, you can solve level. Radial level is a special case of clustered planarity. So if you can solve clustered, well, we don't know how, you can solve radial level. And then maybe the most interesting one, clustered, is a special case of simultaneous embeddability of two graphs. So if you could do simultaneous embeddability with two graphs, you could solve class of planarity, and that may explain why we haven't been able to do simultaneous embeddability with two graphs in spite of trying quite hard. And there's uh, uh, Stephen Joy here. They've tried very hard finding, finding um, uh, obstacles for this. Maybe one reason that we still don't have a complete set of obstacles for simultaneous embeddability with two graphs. By the way, as soon as you go to three graphs, the general problem becomes um, NP-complete. And it's really the same as the weak realizability problem, which in a way is the most general planarity problem of all, because it encodes really every other problem there is. If you have a planarity problem, it's easy to encode it as a weak realizability problem. And we know that this one is NP-complete. Particularly, it's an NP, so you actually have an NP and an algorithm for all of these, except it's, it's not a very natural NP algorithm, so I've not actually seen anybody implement it. <clears throat> so the first part of um, the results in this paper is the, the reduction from cluster planarity to simultaneous embedding of two graphs, showing that uh, cluster planarity is a spe special case of that. So one of them really um, is harder than the other. I'm not going to go into details. This is the core gadget. Essentially, you have to control, if you think of a cluster, you have to control the edges leaving the cluster. <coughs> and by definition, each edge is allowed, each edge that is allowed to cross the boundary is allowed to cross the boundary at most once. So what you have to control is the order in which these edges cross the boundary. And that's what these, this device does here. Uh, you have these three solid edges coming in. And then the simultaneous embedding makes sure that the corresponding pieces going out have the same, have the same um, uh, ordering. Uh, I'm not going to prove it's correct. You can find that uh, in the paper. But the rough idea is that the solid edge here in the middle, once you once you restrict your whole drawing to the solid edges, then you get, uh, you get these two fans over there that are in the same order. You can pull them together like this here, then separate them out, and then the solid edges will give you the embedding of the cluster graph with this edge, with the black solid edges of the device making up the boundary of the of the cluster. So that's the power that um, simultaneous planarity gives you. OK. The, the talk was actually called towards the theory of um, planarity, which, of course, is uh, supposed to reference a paper by Tati wrote in 1970 toward the theory of crossing numbers, because what he tried to do is establish an algebraic theory for crossing number, which um, didn't go very far. Crossing number is hard, and the variety defined algebraic crossing number is apparently as hard as is the regular crossing number. So it didn't really help much. But the idea I'm trying to pursue here is what if we take his idea and just try to apply it to planarity? Well, he did that in 1970 in that paper, so that's well understood. As a matter of fact, uh, Wu and um, around the same time in the 1960s in China, just the paper weren't translated, and uh, Hanan in the 1930s, Van Kempen had done the same stuff already. And that gives us what's now called the Hanani-Tat theorem. Let me just uh, show it to you. Some of you have 
probably seen it before if you see me give a talk recently. I've talked about this uh, a lot. In that case, you may remember it. The point is, if you can draw a graph such that every two independent edges cross each other evenly, then the graph is planar. So if you look at this uh, piece of graph down here, for example, the black edge here is crossed by the red edge here even number of times, or the thick red edge here is crossed by the other red edge here an even number of times. That means we can redraw this without any crossings. Well, we're actually looking at a path, so that's not uh, so particularly interesting, but this works for arbitrary graphs. The point here, though, is um, your first attempt at a proof of this result is, well, whenever you have a bygone, something like this here, two edges uh, bordering empty space, we can just remove it. We can remove crossings, right? That's easy enough. Oops. You're right. Um, but that gets really difficult if there's vertices inside and you cannot use that, uh, you cannot use that method. Uh, I miscalculated with time, so let me fast forward you a little bit through this. What this means is you can phrase planarity as an algebraic system, namely linear system, system of linear inequalities over GF2, which you can solve using Gaussian elimination uh, in linear time. Uh, in uh, cubic time, pl uh, polynomial time. So the, main, the, the first main contribution here is this uh, theorem that says that the same is true for partially embedded planarity. You have a non-etat theorem for that, which you can phrase. Um, it's planar even only if you can find a drawing that extends the partially embedded graph and every two independent edges cross evenly. The nice thing is you get another um, algorithm, polynomial time algorithm, slower than the linear time algorithm, but of the same form as the other one for planarity. Um, how do you prove this? I'll skip that because I'm running out of time, but it's using another recent result by some people in this room that characterize partially embedded planarity using a finite set, actually an infinite set of abstractions and a special notion of minor that works for this. I don't think that's a good way to prove that in theorem, but right now it's the only way I can prove it. Eventually, just like for the projective plane, I hope there will be direct proof not using abstraction sets. But in this case, um, it's the easiest way to do it. So my conjecture would be that there is a most general form of the nani tat theorem that works for all of these planarity variants. So a graph is x planar, where x planar is supposed to be any particular notion of planarity you can think of even only if it has a drawing satisfying x, where you replace a condition that two edges that are independent may not intersect with the weaker condition that they intersect evenly, which means that you can write a polynomial time algorithm to do this. So I just about have time to state the results. I can prove such um, hanani tat theorems for partial rotation, for level planarity that's uh, implicit in an earlier paper. Most interestingly are the results for simultaneous planarity uh, for special cases, for example, if the intersection of the graph consists of uh, disjoint two connected components, or if one of them is a subdivision of a three connected graph, or if the intersection is sub subcubic, all of these yield, interestingly, the same algorithm for testing simultaneous planarity. Why is this, uh, by the way, sorry, this, some of these generalize linear time algorithms for these cases by, again, several people in this uh, room. Why is this interesting? Well, I think it means that on the good side, weak realizability is bad. On the good side, simultaneous planarity for two graphs has the chance to be the universal planarity problem that encodes all other problems. And if we could settle this simple redrawing conjecture here, which says that if we can draw a graph G with subgraph H so that every H edge crosses every other edge that's independent even number of times, then we can remove crossings from <coughs> H with each other. If you could solve this simple redrawing problem here, you would have a, so a solution for the simultaneous planarity problem, which would imply polynomial time solution for the clustered planarity problem, and uh, pretty much any other notion of planarity you can think of. The main point being there's one single algorithm and maybe a couple of reduction to that algorithm. So assuming the conjecture is correct, I could give you an algorithm for that problem right now. I just don't know 
whether the conjecture is correct. Okay, that was it. Thank you. We have time for one question. To specify for each pair of edges whether they may cross or not. Do we have time for one more question? <laughs> no, let's thank our speaker again then. So we're still looking for the last speaker of the session, Chris Mulder. If you have his phone number in your phone, just text him. Um, and our next fantastic, amazing talk by Daniel Archambault about the mental map preservation uh, in dynamic graphs. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Natalie, for that fantastic introduction. <laughs> uh, so yes, uh, I'm Daniel Archambault, and uh, this is uh, joint work with Helen Purchase. Um, and from the title, uh, we found a, a task where uh, the mental map does help in comprehension of dynamic graphs. So here's a very quick outline, fairly standard introduction, previous work, uh, the description of our experiment, uh, the results, and some uh, discussions of these results and conclusions. So. First of all, uh, a few definitions. So what is a dynamic graph? Well, it's a graph that evolves over time, and uh, each snapshot of the graph is, is uh, a time slice, or a graph at the given time. And quite frequently, animation, or this sort of movie-type uh, uh, presentation, is used to display uh, graph evolution. Another way to uh, depict uh, the evolution of the graph is sort of like a film strip. Uh, this is called a small multiples approach. And each time slice is in its own window, and the, uh, the user of the, this system will scan the windows to determine how the graph evolves. It's not all prevalent. In, in dynamic uh, graph drawing, and it might be interesting to look at uh, some techniques based on this. So what is the mental map? Well, it's sort of this notion that drawing stability is important. Uh, it was defined in the works of Masui, Ease, Lai, and Sugiyama. Um, and there's also a formal dish definition of Coleman and Parker, provided in a journal article in 1996 where essentially the placement of existing nodes and edges should change as little po as possible when a change is made to the graph. So there's many dynamic graph uh, drawing algorithms that use this uh, definition of the mental map. Um, and conversely, to define what I mean by non-mental map, essentially each time slice is laid out independently. So the nodes are allowed to fly uh, all over the plane in the, the animation. So there's been a, a fair number of experiments already done, and none of these experiments have shown a benefit for the mental map. Most of these experiments show no effect, so it doesn't help or hurt. Um, and there's one or two that actually shows that it hinders a little bit, um, but this was primarily to, due to things like node overlap and, and clutter. Now it's important to note that most of these experiments test a notion of readability or memorability. So these are tasks of extracting or reading paths and that sort of thing from the graph, or the ability to recall um, certain elements uh, of evolution. In our case, what we're doing is we're testing orientation. So this is related both to readability and memorability, but there's a more uh, of a focus on the relative position of information and uh, how it's used for revisitation of certain parts of the graph. Um, so why are we looking at this? Well, it turns out that if you go back to the field of psychology, there's three uh, very interesting uh, experiments. So it turns out for uh, a small number of targets, uh, people can, are, are very, very good at uh, following these targets even when they're moving randomly on the screen. So the first one, um, don't ask me to pronounce that name, and Strom uh, found that uh, the number of targets is around five. So if you have five randomly moving nodes or, or dots moving against a field of uh, distractors, it turns out people can get uh, the answer close to 85% of the time. Uh, subsequently, uh, Yantis uh, confirmed these results and extended it 
saying that if the targets have coordinated motion, you can even scale further beyond five. Uh, and it was also reconfirmed by Liu et al., um, where they uh, essentially replicated many of these results in an air, air traffic control scenario. So uh, many, uh, a second thing, a second drawback of, of these experiments is that many of them use pre-attentively, uh, pre-attentive color highlighting of the nodes in order to disambiguate which nodes are talked about in the question. In this case, the mental map is probably not as important in this scenario because the red node stays red and you don't need to track it. You can immediately look away at some other node and immediately come back to the red node. So because of these two limitations, um, I think we can cover most of the experiments uh, where we didn't, found, uh, didn't find an effect. So here's our primary research question. The first one is, does the mental map help with uh, orientation in the data for these revi revisitation tasks? And the secondary research questions are, uh, does the number of targets influence performance? And also, does animation or small multiples uh, influence performance? So as I mentioned, there's many experiments. Uh, a couple um, here, one of them was purchase. Uh, where essentially she was looking at uh, degree reading tasks and um, we're trying to figure out uh, which nodes in the graph have a large or small degree. Uh, in this experiment she found that a compromise uh, was significantly worse than uh, keeping nodes uh, essentially pinned and allowing nodes to fly everywhere on the screen, which is a little bit counterintuitive. Uh, in some of my own work, um, we tested the mental map uh, when comparing animation to small multiples. We, tend to, we tested a lot of tasks, and we found no significant difference of notable uh, magnitude between mental map preservation and non-mental map preservation. There's a recent experiment by Gani uh, where they were testing uh, the order of insertion of deletions of nodes and edges uh, in, in a dynamic graph series. Uh, animation was used, um, and they also used an aggregation method. So essentially, they drew out the dynamic graph once and pinned uh, vertices to their final positions. Um, and evolution was shown without uh, uh, animated transitions. In this strategy, it turned out that uh, pinning outperformed the no mental map preservation. But these tests uh, really didn't test reading uh, paths or, or re revisitation, not really that much in terms of structure. And so you can sort of view this experiment as space where they were testing more time type factors. So here's our experimental design. We have two mental map uh, preservation conditions uh, followed by the two presentation methods. Uh, three target levels. These target levels correspond to the work in psychology. It was inspired by uh, making sure that we're using sufficient numbers of targets. And a two-question design. So essentially our tasks are, uh, the first one's essentially a revisitation task. So uh, the participant is required to relocate uh, nodes that were indicated at the beginning of the animation. Secondly, is uh, to read long paths that stretch the graph. If they're, if they're short, we're, we're conjecturing that the mental map doesn't help too much. But as they get longer, uh, they become more difficult to follow. And we have these uh, uh, three sets of target levels for, for both of these tasks, uh, inspired by the work in psychology. So there's a number of algorithms that we could have used uh, in order to present the uh, mental map. But uh, inspired by some, some work uh, at GD uh, 2011 uh, by Ulrich Brandes, uh, there's some metrics that show that um, sort of linking, strategy, linking strategies uh, conform best to the Coleman and Parker definition of the mental map. So we chose uh, the Ertner et al. Uh, algorithm, which is one of these uh, linking strategies. So what are the tasks? You had a number of colored nodes at the beginning. I realize this is kind of quick. What's a, linking a linking strategy is essentially, so you have your time slices. Um, the nodes have given labels, okay? So the same node can be relocated uh, in each time slice. And you connect uh, nodes of the same label between time slices with inner time slice edges. 
And then you use this hybrid graph to uh, lay uh, nodes uh, out in such a way that uh, the same node hovers around in the same position in the plane. So by adjusting the strength of these inner time slice edges, you can sort of keep nodes closer to, the, to their location. And by making them loose, they, they fly all over the place. OK? So you have a bunch of colored nodes. This is the mental map preservation condition. Um, you follow how the, the graph evolves. And then the user goes and, and clicks on uh, the colored node that, that they were asked. So what's the blue vertex in this case? And this was task one, which is our revisitation task. Now on the non-mental map preservation condition, we have a path. And you have to follow the path as this graph swirls around. And at the end, you have to indicate the, the path uh, in the correct order uh, in order to answer the question. So uh, our primary result is there's a significant difference between non-mental map and mental map preservation for both of these tasks, um, both in terms of time and error rate. So that means mental map preservation was both faster and uh, created fewer uh, errors. We did not find a significant dif difference in this task between animation and small multiples. Uh, but the interesting thing is, as the mental map worsened, uh, animation on average seemed to perform a little bit better. But we can't say that much because we don't have a significant difference. Uh, when we look at uh, divided by target level, this uh, phenomenon um, repeats itself for all of our target levels tested. Uh, it's always important that uh, your users like uh, what you, what you uh, present to them. And so we, we asked a few questions. We didn't really explain what the mental map was, but we asked a few questions about do you like your nodes moving all over the place or staying in uh, relative uh, same area of the plane. And it turns out that most of the features associated with high levels of mental map preservation were preferred to those uh, that were um, associated with less uh, mental map preservation. So in terms of discussions, uh, we have an experiment that shows drawing stability of the mental map helps. Uh, this uh, confirms a little bit uh, some of the intuitive notions of uh, Masu, Eads, Lides, and Sugiyama. Um, and it turns out that uh, mental map pr preservation produces both uh, significantly fewer errors and faster uh, response times. Uh, we replicated the results in psychology. Um, there is a very high number, uh, a very high accuracy for a number of uh, independently non-colliding targets, uh, confirming these results. And also, uh, coordination of movement increases accuracy further. Uh, if you look at uh, the results in our paper, these uh, long paths actually performed a lot better than the individual node task. Uh, we didn't notice um, any significant definition between animation and small multiples. We had some tendencies towards animation, especially when the mental map was not uh, preserved. So there is potentially some uh, evidence that animated transitions can help, but further uh, experiments are needed in order to, to confirm this. So in conclusion, um, preserving the mental map in a Coleman Park uh, Parker sense helps uh, in this sense, keeping track of specific areas of the graph as uh, the graph evolves over time and following long uh, paths through the graph as it evolves over time. However, uh, we need to be very, very careful when we use this result. So these benefits are only uh, really realized when uh, pre-attentive highlighting is not used and also, uh, the number of nodes and edges in the task is uh, large. So uh, you've got to make sure that you, you max out this number of uh, moving targets. And if you have a task that does these two things, well, we think that the Coleman-Parker definition will probably help. So uh, I think that's my time. And are there any questions? Go ahead.
the speed fixed, or could people replay what they saw, or maybe move back and forth on the side? Uh, so we, we allowed full control of the animation to the user. They could evolve it at their own rate if they uh, felt it was too fast. We had a default speed, and that default speed um, was uh, determined uh, through piloting. But it's interesting with this experiment because in previous experiments, a lot of people didn't engage with the animation condition at all. And with this one, the majority of participants uh, actually used the slider a fair bit. So um, there you go. <laughs> That's what I observed. That's yes, Peter. Uh, the animation was just linear interpolation, was it? Yes. Okay. I have a comment too, which is um, just from my intuition, which is not, you know, not no theory. Yes. Uh, the um, pinning strategy or the linking strategy should not be the uh, is a little bit too strong for preserving the mental map. Okay. That, uh, that because people can follow translations mm -hmm. quite easily. Yes. That um, that something more topological. Or more, um, uh, more about orders of things rather than about absolute positions mm -hmm. is, is a weaker form of a mental map and probably just as powerful as for, for the human end. I, I'm, I'm not surprised that the linking strategy, uh, that the pinning strategy doesn't show uh, an improvement. Yes, um, so you're talking more about, I can remember there's an AP Viz paper about the relative position using, um, yeah, uh, using um, uh, simulated annealing. It would be really interesting, I, I don't know of too many algorithms that use that definition of the mental map. It would be really interesting for the community to investigate that further. And of course, it would be really interesting to run more experiments to see, you know, comparing uh, this more, um, spatial position uh, type definition versus this more relative uh, definition, especially for the location task. Uh, I have a feeling that uh, you're probably right there. Yes? I understand correctly in, in, in your experiment, uh, the graph didn't really change, just sort of moved around, right? Oh, no. There was node insertions and deletions. Oh, okay. Uh, the um, I think for insertions, deletions, the maximum number was four uh, for both nodes and edges. I think edges, uh, no, sorry. I think for nodes it was four, and for edges it was five. But did you notice uh, any difference in terms of, like, uh, did you kind of sort of separate, like, when you had, didn't really have too much of this insertion deletion before, versus when you had more, if there was any difference in terms of performance? So there was two sizes of graphs. Um, in terms of, we were sort of lucky for in terms of insertion and deletions. It was approximately the same between each time slice. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm partially stretching the truth there, but it was it was pretty close. Um, I think, yeah, I think we should probably do a little bit of further analysis in our data to, to be able to confirm what you're saying. Um, but I think we can do that. I think we measured some of that. So. Okay, let's thank our speaker. So our next talk is going to be terrific. From uh, Stephen Chaplick, and he's going to talk about planarity again. Oops, <laughs> I love planarity. I don't completely understand it, but... <laughs> Okay, thank you for another very uh, vigorous uh, introduction. It's uh, nice to have an enthusiastic uh, chair. So this work that I'm talking about is uh, some that I did when I was in, visiting Charles University last year. And uh, my co-author, Torsten Eukert, was also there at the time. He's now at uh, Karlsruhe uh, Institute of Technology. And there seem to be a large contingent of his uh, colleagues that have shown up uh, to this conference, so it's nice to see. So what I'm going to be really talking about is a nice new geometric intersection representation of planar graphs. So in particular, I'm going to be giving you a bit of a background on intersection families of graphs in case you uh, need it. And then I'm going to get into these new, relatively new class, 
which is really closely related to intersection graphs of curves in the plane. So it's a specialization of that. Okay, so intersection families of graphs. Again, you know the basic idea of intersection families. We have some blobs. When they intersect, the blobs correspond to our vertices. When they intersect, we get edges. So basic stuff here. Every graph can be represented easily with a generic kind of intersection family. Usually the intersection is, is phrased as a collection of sets. But more often than not, we want some nice structure like geometry or, or other structures to make the classes more interesting. OK, so the more interesting classes that I'm going to be talking about in this presentation are string graphs, VPG graphs, and this special case of VPG graphs called BKVPG. So what is a VPG graph? Well, if you take your string graph, you just have arbitrary curves in the plane. Well, rather than drawing them as arbitrary curves, we're going to draw them as axis-aligned rectilinear curves. So in this sense, they're the intersection graphs of paths in grids. So you can imagine a, a rectangular grid lying underneath this, this structure. And we're just looking at intersection graphs of paths and grids. Now, when some edges can be represented nicely, and some edges can be represented in rather curious ways. So we want to be a bit more careful about what we're talking about. So we're going to restrict ourselves even further to say the paths only have a certain number of bends. So you can see this blue path here only has one bend, whereas the red path has four. And over there, it's just a mess. So we're really going to be talking about small numbers of bends. But I want to talk about a closely related family of graphs that is also relevant to this talk. So if we take another perspective, rather than just arbitrary curves, we could have straight line segments. Now, the idea of straight line segments has been well studied and is a very popular graph class, especially when we're talking about planarity. There was a long-standing conjecture that every planar graph was representable as a segment graph. And this was proven quite recently by uh, Jeremy Chalopin and Daniel Gonsalves. And this was a, a phenomenal result. And there were many, many results leading up to it. Uh, just as another closely related class, we have the circle graphs, which are chords of a, intersection graphs of chords of a circle. Okay, so, but again, what I really want to talk about are these paths and grids. So, <clears throat> specifically, in the, in the original paper by this rather long list of authors, they showed that they proved this folklore result saying that string graphs are the same as these rectilinear curves. And they also showed that circle graphs can be contained in B1, so B1 is just this situation where we only have one bend that's allowed, but you could have all the four shapes, right? Um, <clears throat> they noted that planar is contained in B3, and I'll talk about that a bit later. It uses a known construction, and they actually conjectured that three was as good as you're going to do to get all planar. Well, in this talk, I'm going to tell you that that's not the case. In fact, we can do it with two bends, and <clears throat> We can actually do triangle free planar using a special case of contact B1. Okay, so how do they do this with uh, three bends? Well, there's this really nice construction by Defresex, uh, Osana de Mendez, and Rosenthal, which says that every planar graph is a contact system of T's. Well, if I take this planar graph, I can build my contact system just by taking an outside edge and starting with these two t's, putting the next vertex in the middle, and you'll notice that the points of all the t's are always sticking up. So as I shell my planar graph, I just stack my t's on top. And if we want it as a B3 representation, I just draw the t's with three bends, and we get the representation. <coughs> but in, on some level, it's not as nice as the T's, because now I have to have these, these uh, side contacts instead of just point contacts. So that's a small detail. Some people like to, to talk about side contacts, so uh, it's usually worth mentioning. OK, so how do we improve on this? How do we get beyond this nice, straightforward, translation between T's and these B3's, well, <clears throat> we're going to first look at four connected, 
planar graphs because four connected planar graphs have really nice structure and in fact we get this nice rectangular tiling that we can use from four connected planar graphs. So <clears throat> from the four connected planar graphs we're actually going to build uh, an intersection graph of Z shapes. So these would just be uh, two horizontals connected by a, a vertical. And from that we can get all four connected planar graphs and then we'll just perturb our Z's a little, go inside the, set, the filled triangles and fill in the rest of our representation. <coughs> okay, so, and to do that we just use the separation tree which follows just through filled triangles. So we start with some triangle, we take the maximal piece that we get without any filled triangles, we go inside the filled triangles and we recurse further down. Okay, so again, what is this main tool that we're using? The main tool is that <coughs> four connected planar triangulations have representations by uh, tiled rectangles. So we can take our graph and we can make a rectangular tiling out of it. Uh, one small detail that I want to mention is by a triangulation, <coughs> I, I don't want to just add edges because it's so much easier for me to add vertices to the faces to triangulate them. So I'll add a vertex universe to the face. And then when I want the original graph back, I'll just delete the part of the representation that I built. Okay, so that's what I mean by triangulation. Rather than the adding edges, I'm adding vertices. Right, so we have our rectangular tiling. Uh, but we don't want just any rectangular tiling. Some rectangular tilings are not going to be as nice when we're trying to create the Z shapes out of it. In particular, if I have this pattern in my rectangular tiling, as you can see here, and Remember, as I was saying, I'm going to want to replace each of my tiles with a Z shape. So <clears throat> if I was adding the Z shape here somewhere and one here, well, how would I make the intersection? Well, the nice thing is that I can avoid uh, the bad configuration. Sorry, this is the, the one that I'm trying to avoid. I can avoid the bad configurations by redrawing the, uh, redrawing the tiles with a slight, just sliding Y over and W down a little bit and I get a different orientation. There's a few more technical details but I don't want to go into them. Uh, the nice thing is that we can fix our tiling using uh, the technique from Pusi in 2009. So, but how are we going to make the Zs really? So, again, after we've done this nice, we, after we've redrawn our tiling in a nice way, we'll have the tiles above our current tile uh, all to the left, and I can make this splitting point for the center of the Z. And below, I'll have them, the centers all to the right. So, when I make the Z shapes, this center will be always to the left of the guy below it and always to the right of the guy above it. And there will be nobody further to the right. And this allows me to catch all of these Z's after I would make them with even just a side contact. <clears throat> and that's the, the short version of the construction. So ultimately we get something that looks like this, but we want a bit more space because we want to be able to go inside the filled triangles and this is where we use the fact that it's an intersection representation rather than a contact representation. So <clears throat> all I'm going to do is stretch up my Z's a little bit and push them down a little bit to make some space. Okay, so now I have space. What do I really mean by space? <clears throat> I mean I can look at this triangle where this is the triangle corresponding to the three rectangles and I can identify a region on the Z shapes where I have the three sides of the triangle showing up. And this happens for the different cases that we get. There's just one really annoying case. And <clears throat> I haven't said why it's not just 
ZVPG the whole way through for all planar graphs. And this is why. So if I happen to have this triangle on the bottom being filled, so I have this guy, this guy, and this guy as my filled triangle. When I build the representation for this, if I were to just use a Z shape or a straight line, I wouldn't have this private region that I want to be able to recurse inside. So I have to use a C shape in order to make sure that this line is not touched by anything else. And it's just really annoying because this is the only place in the construction where we have to use a different shape other than the Zs. But anyway, that's how we do all planar graphs with B2. So what about, uh, what about a nice contact representation? What, what can we say? Well, there's lots and lots and lots of work that's been done on contact representations. The classic one is uh, by Kobe. Oh, and <coughs> uh, this image actually I took from uh, David Epstein's webpage, but the reference seems to be cut off on the bottom. Uh, so there's lots of work that's been done. And even for the case of triangle free, triangle free was one of the cases that was studied in the earlier work on segment graphs. Because they wanted to show, well, bipartite was studied first, and they showed that with two directions of line segments, you can do all planar bipartite. And then they showed that uh, various groups have, have worked on these problems. And <clears throat> in particular, this is the result that I want to talk about right now. So you actually get that all triangle free planar graphs can be represented by line segments with three directions. So in the same sense, we considered studying triangle free planar graphs with respect to these L shapes and more specifically L shapes for us. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I just want to mention this very, very recent result. So uh, earlier this year, I was talking to my co-author, uh, Thorsten, and he told me that at the Bertinoro uh, workshop, he worked with uh, Kubarov and Verbeek to look at these, um, look at the relationship between contact segment graphs and contact B1BPG, and they've actually shown that these are in fact the same class. So this is a very new result. Okay, so, but what are we saying? Well, we're actually going to say that triangle free planar graphs are contact L's, gamma's, horizontal and vertical segments. So it's not, we don't even need the whole class. We just need these four shapes. OK, how are we going to prove it? Well, <clears throat> suppose that you have a separating C4. We're just going to assume that everything always works with separating C4s, and that'll be our inductive hypothesis. OK, so, but, okay, so now you don't have any separating C4s anymore. So now we go and we look around, and we find a, a facial C4. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take V1 and V3, I'm going to contract them together, I'm going to get some model back out of L's and gamma's and segments. And then I'm going to have this guy V tilde, which is a contracted vertex, and he has some L. Well, part of my induction will be that the circular order of the edges is maintained. It's a contact representation, so we can always do this. And because of that, I can just split off the two L's, as you can see on the far side. OK, so <clears throat> another easy case is, or an a easy case of the harder case is, OK, so now we don't have any C4s at all. We have no facial C4s. We have no separating C4s. Now what happens? So now we have some interior edge floating around. And again, I contract it. I get a new model for it. Again, the cyclic order of the edges is the same. I uncontract it, and I can make two pieces out of it. Well, this is not telling you the whole story. As you can see, this is case 3A. In particular, it matters where the edges appear for each vertex. And this is how we get some more cases. In particular, we get one annoying case. <laughs> so you'll see that in cases 3C and 3D, I still end up with L's. I can always do the, this 
expansion of my contracted edge, and I still get L's. But if, <clears throat> if I have only this little piece, and I have these horizontal segments sticking into it, we couldn't find a good way to, un to undo the contraction and still only use L's. So this is where we have to use gammas. So there's this little case in both of, the, of our constructions where we have to add these extra shapes. And it's just really frustrating. So, so this, but this completes the proof. So if we, we always either have an interior edge or we have a C4 or we have a separating C4. So that's all that there really is to it. And other than this annoying case, we get the whole contact representation <coughs> with L's. And here, we have to use gammas. OK, so to sum up, we looked at four connected planar graphs. And we got inter uh, a side contact representation using Z's. And then we can take that and recurse inside the filled triangles to get all planar graphs with B2. We have to add those C shapes. And at the same time, we also have this uh, every triangle free planar graph has this nice contact representation. Now, here's the most interesting part. At least I think it's the most interesting part. <clears throat> We've been trying to find a planar graph which we cannot represent with just L shapes in the intersection variety. But we can't. We haven't been able to. And a colleague of mine even did a short computer search on all planar graphs less than 10 vertices. And he built intersection models for all of them with just L shapes. So we were, while we do think it would still be somewhat surprising, we were starting to believe that all planar graphs can be represented as intersection graphs of L's. And we're very interested to, to see if anybody has any nice ideas on how to pursue this further. At the same time, we, we think a slightly easier conjecture would be just to get all the triangle-free planar graphs without using gammas. So just that one little case needs to be fixed. And <clears throat> I guess on the other side of thing, contact representations are always really nice to have. Can we improve on using three bends to represent all planar graphs? So far, we can get four connected with the Z shapes, but we can't seem to, to keep it as a, a contact representation if we want to go to all planar graphs. Uh, on the other hand, we could try to strengthen the the T's result. So can you use something simpler than T's, some special case of T's, something like that. Uh, that's my presentation, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Okay. Well, as uh, Dr. Schneiderman mentioned earlier yesterday, there's a lot of different uh, algorithms and layouts and everything for static graphs, but dynamic graphs are still a big challenge. You know, we can handle graphs of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of nodes and edges if they're static. But when they're moving at that scale, there's not very much uh, available. So quick definition of a dynamic graph, it's a sequence of, t of uh, snapshots, right? So we have a series of graphs with a set of vertices and a set of edges. Uh, usually there's a lot of overlap between those, but uh, and we want to understand this network, how it changes over time, how the uh, overall structure evolves, like how do the clusters in this graph evolve over time, and maybe even track individual node, nodes, right? How does an individual node move around this network? Um, <clears throat> and there are some existing methods, but they often don't scale very well to the large networks that I'm considering in this work. Uh, I've yet to see a work that was handling uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of nodes or hundreds or thousands of time steps. Um, this is because a lot of existing methods are either, or they're usually uh, force directed, so there's some amount of a computation cost there. Uh, they're usually incremental, right? So given a time step, they start working on one very next time step immediately after, but they don't consider the, whole, the graph as a whole, the whole uh, temporal range at once. And so this can get them into local minima in the long run if the, if the network evolves too far. <clears throat> 
Um, so they're usually based on some sort of rubber banding or uh, gluing, right? So they take nodes and they fix their positions or restrict their movement. And that, that's sort of what helps, well, what can cause that local minima in the long run. <clears throat> and there's generally a trade-off between quality and stability, right? So if a uh, network changes a lot, you can either forgo, forgo the uh, rubber banding and let the quality of the graph layout be uh, temporarily local, or you can forego the quality of the layout and keep the, keep the nodes uh, rooted at their position, right? So if a node never moves at all, obviously it's going to be stable, but the layout will suffer. So we wanted to be able to uh, try to get both quality and stability for lar these very large networks, uh, because at this scale, even a little motion can be very distracting, right? Um, <clears throat> on beyond even the uh, mental map issues. Um, so we wanted to be able to handle, we wanted a quick layout so we can avoid layout cost. Uh, we want to be able to handle large complex networks and we want to avoid issues like information overload. If there's too much information being thrown at the user all at once, what can we reduce? What can we simplify so the user can actually follow a large network? And we wanted to avoid motion overload, which is what I'm saying, what I want to say is uh, far beyond any mental map study that I've seen. And what, what I mean by that is, if it'll load, if we have thousands of vertices and it's supposed to be playing a video. Well, it loaded the first frame, but it does not seem to be playing the video. So if we have thousands of vertices all moving very little bits, very little motion, but they're all moving in random directions, you end up with this chaos that's very hard to follow. Like the, crust, the cluster structure is very stable, but the overall motion is very chaotic, very hard to follow, very distracting. And you can't actually pick out individual patterns in there. On the other hand, if we have very smooth motion, very, uh, so every, all the nodes are still moving, but they're moving together as groups. So they're very stable in a, relative to their neighbors in this graph. And you can easily track a large scale motions. You can see that clusters move together. You can see growth in clusters. And you can even see some edges you know, flickering in and out as they're uh, not very stable, they're not very, uh, <coughs> not very uh, durable over time. Um, So what this is is not even just a mental map issue, this is even just a simple perception issue, right? The human eye can't track that many moving objects all at once. It's better to be able to perceive large scale motion, right? If the human eye can track a large set of clusters or even individual clusters moving together as long as they're moving together and not moving randomly within that cluster. And so even though in both cases they were using the same clustering, ordering, and rendering techniques, uh, in both cases the nodes moved short distances and in both cases, all the nodes are moving. There was a huge difference in as far as what the human eye can perceive in those two examples I showed. Um, in, the, in the first one, the nodes were moving chaotically, and the eye can't track them in the sunburst. Uh, the, the eye can perceive the large scale motion. So what we wanted was to extend these ideas and, uh, because those particular examples kind of sacrificed quality in terms of stability. So th they didn't necessarily calculate a very good layout for every time step. They reuse some information from pre previous time steps and kind of sacrifice the uh, quality of the layout to keep everything very stable and very quick. Um, <clears throat> so what we wanted to do was de develop a layout that could be ideal or um, it would have high quality for every time step in the entire data set. Um, we wanted to ensure the node stability. So nodes that behave constantly. So if, if a node does not change its edges, it's connected to the same neighbors and their neighbors aren't moving, it should not move either, right? So we wanted to eliminate all unnecessary node motion. Um, when nodes do move, we want them to move together if they're moving together. So we don't want nodes to be moving very randomly, very chaotically. And we wanted to very clearly show large scale structures like the clusters or, and, and uh, like where nodes are actually tracking through these clusters. So how the nodes move and how the uh, clusters form change, and do they split or merge, and when do the clusters die off? 
So what we did was a uh, two-stage approach, basically. So we're, we have a large set of uh, temporally aware clustering, or basically algorithms for clustering and ordering nodes within a large dynamic graph. And then we have some set of visualizations for how to actually view these clusters and use them to uh, lay out the network. So for the clustering step, uh, like I said, we want every time step to be locally ideal. So we cluster every time step individually. So cause be, be, because every cluster, every time step could be completely different, right? So the, the clusters can be different between different time steps, and we want each time step to be uh, clustered correctly. Um, we use a standard clustering algorithm based on modularity, um, similar uh, Newman and Moore's, classic Newman and Moore's. And we use this because the, the clustering actually behaves very similar. There's a, a result by NOAC that shows that the uh, modularity clustering is very similar, preserves same, similar properties to force directed layouts. So we, we want to be able to preserve that uh, structure for uh, l the layout purposes later. And don't want to bore you with math here. It's in the paper if you want to look it up. Um, but since we cluster every time step differently, we need to then map the clusters between different time steps, right? So the cluster three in one time step might be cluster five in the next time step, but we don't know that. So we need to go through all the clusters and between two time steps, compare them against each other and figure out which clusters actually line up, right? Because a cluster could split, it can merge, there could be overlap between clusters, like in this example here, where one node transfers back and forth between two clusters. Um, and so to, this is very similar to a problem in uh, uh, feature tracking in, in the scientific visualization, where they have features that they're tracking through a volume, and they need to associate them together. So they use some sort of similarity metric between the features and then compare them against each other and pick the features that most, clo most closely match up. And so we do a similar thing using the Jacquard index, which is a set membership and um, similarity metric. And using this, we, can then, we then end up with these uh, temporal clusters over time. So we have these clusters throughout time with the membership changes now, but we have a single cluster over time. So we have a set of uh, clusters through time. And we want to then order these clusters because there's going to be nodes moving between them, and we want to minimize the amount of motion that these nodes have to travel, right? So we want to minimize the distance the nodes have to travel. And that's a classic uh, minimum linear arrangement problem. We want to minimize the, uh, basically the edge crossings in this kind of a uh, representation, and minimize the uh, length of the edges in this kind of representation. But it's a 1D ordering. So we have one, one dimension is going to be the order of the clusters, and the other dimension is going to be time. Um, similarly, we also want to order the nodes within this, these clusters because we want, to, if a node's going to be moving up and down between a cluster and it's a neighbor that's above it, we want it to be towards the top of that cluster. And also within a cluster, we want uh, the, the layout to be aware of the connectivity within that cluster so that we can uh, guarantee good node layout later on. So we, once again, we want to keep the uh, layout quality good and we want to uh, keep the nodes as stable as we can. So we want to minimize the node motion. Um, also, within a time cluster, one node will always have the, we want, we want one node to always have the same position within that cluster. So, if it's in that cluster at any given time, it will not move. Um, yeah, and what this boils down to is basically another minimum linear arrangement. So, we can use, apply the same algorithm to order the nodes that we did to order the clusters. So, once we've done with that process, we now have an ordered set of clusters that are persistent over time. And within those clusters, we have an ordered set of node locations that are also persistent over time. Um, so now we can track how the nodes move between clusters and keep them uh, persistent. We can, so we can look at which clusters nodes belong to. Uh, we can look at how the nodes tra traverse between the, the clusters. Um, we can jump to the network structure at any time, and we want to uh, see how the network overall changes over time. So the first thing we have is a timeline view, which gives us an overview of the entire cluster structures. So now we can start getting into the pictures. Um, so this is very simple, just like before where I showed the uh, example of the clusters over time. We have the clusters on the y-axis, and then we have time on the x-axis. And then we can just, using a simple line diagram, track how the nodes move between clusters. Because they have a given position within each cluster. And they have, the clusters have a given order, and the nodes have a given order. So we can easily just plot 
how the nodes move between clusters. And this actually gives us a very nice, succinct summary of the evolution of a network. So the, every line in this image is a uh, node in this time varying network. And we can easily see how the nodes change their clustering structure over time, right? So there's some clusters that are fairly consistent, although there's a couple blips in the beginning, for example, here. Um, Right. Here's a node that starts off in a completely different cluster and then, it, or a node that actually kind of splits this cluster up and then moves over here and lets that cluster resume its uh, structure. And so it, it's just a very succinct summary. So once we have that though, we want to be able to actually look at the entire network at any given time. And so we can use this cluster and ordering to define a layout using uh, some previous work of ours on a space filling curve based layout. So we can take this one dimensional positioning and map it along a convoluted space filling curve and that maps this one dimensional ordering to a 2D space and guarantees some nice properties such as the uh, aspect ratio of clusters is a, is a guaranteed, uh, it's guaranteed to not create any long and skinny clusters because the aspect ratio is uh, contained. And uh, Clusters are guaranteed to be co-located co and all, all this good stuff. And we can do this very, very quickly because it's very simple to map this given 1D ordering to this 2D space. Um, once that we have that, we can then apply some standard graph techniques, you know, uh, edge op uh, opacity modulation or tone mapping. We can apply edge bundling. So we have, because we already have the clusters, it's easy to apply a hierarchical, hierarchical edge bundling to this network. So we can route the edges according to this hierarchy that we've already computed. And that gives us a good uh, view of the high level structure in each time step. Um, and then also, since we've pre-computed all of this clustering and ordering for the whole network, the, the whole dynamic network, we can then interact with it and explore it. So we can easily jump between different time steps without having to, uh, without having to iterate over the entire graph the temporal graph to, to get there because it's not uh, incremental. And then we can also use animated transitions to help the user follow the changes between networks. So once again, quick video. And that one does not want to play. Great. <laughs> That's no good. I might have something on here. Should open with quick, quick time. <laughs> awesome. Well, I guess you're going to have to uh, talk to me later on my laptop to see the actual video of this, which really, really kind of sucks. I want to show this video. Um, so the next example I was going to show was another video, which is a large scale example. So this is scaling it up to a network with uh, 50,000 nodes and a couple hundred thousand edges. Uh, over time, over 400 different ti 400 time steps. Uh, usually it's about 12 to 30,000 nodes per time step and 20 to 70 edges, or 20 to 70 K edges per time step. Um, at this scale, you almost don't have enough pix pixels on the screen to represent individual nodes, so it's very hard to track individual nodes usually. Um, but large scale patterns of behaviors are very interesting to see how clusters form, how they evolve, and how they die off in this network. And once again, I was going to show a video over here, but it's not going to work. But in the timeline, you can even see that there's some very stable clusters. So what this is a network of is the uh, routers of the internet, the autonomous systems of the internet, how they've evolved over about a decade. Very large, very complex network, uh, real world network. And you can see that there's some clusters of stability. So this, this cluster, for example, is actually uh, like the US West Coast. And you can see that some other clusters there's some that form, they, they evolve over time, they, they slowly transition out of this. And 
there's some other stable clusters that form over time, right? So there's some that actually evolve. Like uh, one of these is uh, Russia, developed halfway through this time this data set and started developing a large internet presence. My text is running short because I don't have the video. <laughs> so, what we've developed here is a uh, globally optimized layout for uh, these dynamic networks. So, we use all the time steps to compute these orderings and these clusterings, and we don't use an incremental method, which allows us to achieve both high quality on every time step and stability over time. Right. So, the clustering for each time step is still time independent, even though we've associated them across time we've still guaranteed some certain clustering properties for every time step. And nodes that do not change are actually kept completely stationary so that we can avoid excess uh, or unnecessary motion. Um, and also, very nice property of this is that most of the computation is pre-processed. So we can actually allow for a lot of interactive or very rapid exploration of these very, very large networks, even on like laptops. They don't, it, the actual exploration and rendering does not take that much processing power. And it's very useful for showing the large scale structures. But maybe be at this scale, it's less useful for showing individual nodes right now. But that's one of the things that we want to uh, maybe work on in the future is some more advanced interaction techniques. So one thing that we haven't really focused on yet is optimizing the computation. Because we've done it as a pre-processing step. Uh, but there are several ways we could actually optimize or improve the uh, efficiency of the computation. Um, particularly the association steps that we can optimize and the ordering algorithm is really the uh, slowest part, because that's the NP-complete par uh, part of this problem right now. Um, once we actually have those clusters, we, can, we also want to consider better space utilization. right? So back in that internet example, uh, there was a lot of empty space up here and empty space down here that like, this cluster doesn't necessarily have to be placed all the way at the top of the network. It could have started down here instead, for example. And we don't actually consider how to. Uh, break up, because we, we, we had that temporarily consistent cluster across all of time, even if it actually disappears halfway through the data set. So that's a potential way to improve the results in the future. Uh, we also want to look at alternate graph layouts, because uh, you didn't get to see the video, but some of the clusters are actually very, very tight. And so we're not fully utilizing the screen space as, as best as we could. Um, the other thing was we were only looking at uh, clusters pairwise, so we're only looking at two time steps at a time for the association process. And so you ended up with clusters that form for one time step and then dis disappear. And so we can maybe do a higher order clustering and try to eliminate some of that excess noise. Um, and also, since we're clustering every time step independently, there's a certain amount of cost that we're not reusing the information. So if a graph changes by one node every time step, we're recomputing the entire clustering every time step. And so there should be some way to uh, do an iterative clustering and modify the clustering over time instead of having to recalculate from scratch every time step. So that, that's so some of the directions that we want to look at in the future. So quick acknowledgments from NSF and CCF, or through NSF through those grants. And that's all I have for the talk because the videos didn't work. So any questions now and or uh, come see me later to, see, to actually see the videos working. Thank you, Chris. Any questions? I didn't say the video, but there seem to be a lot of clusters. Um, with, I mean, you know, going to what somebody else said, only five, you can only follow five things moving or something like that. But you seem to have much more clusters than that. Is that right? Or, or maybe I'll put this way. Yeah, in the mental map study, they said there was only, you, you can only really track five things moving. Um, and yes, we do have a lot more clusters than that at, the time, at this moment. Uh, but I, I find that I can actually track it, and it's still much better. It's, just, it's part of the whole scalability issue. Right? Dealing with networks at this size, we're lucky to only have the amount of clusters that we have, as opposed to many, many more. Um, yeah, the, the best way to answer that question is to show you the video. So I guess uh, I'll have to show you the video after offline. OK, we don't have much more time before our yummy lunch, so yep. let's thank our speaker. Bef before you all go, I just have a few announcements. So for the speaker of the next session this afternoon, please go to the registration and sign up your form so we can record your talk and then put it available online.
And the second one concerns the, the nice dinner you have tonight. If you're curious about the bus schedule, uh, there is a bunch of um, schedules available at the registration as well. So you can know when you're going to go and so on. Thank you, have fun and good lunch. <laughs>